Chapter Thirty Three of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Three. Pinocchio is trained for the circus. Finding that the door remained shut, the little man burst it open with a violent kick, and coming into the room, he said to Pinocchio and Candlewick with his usual little laugh. <laughs> well done, boys. You brayed well, and I recognized you by your voices. That is why I am here. At these words, the two little donkeys were quite stupefied, and stood with their heads down, their ears lowered, and their tails between their legs. At first, the little man stroked and caressed them. Then, taking out a curry comb, he curry combed them well. And when by this process he had polished them till they shone like two mirrors, he put a halter round their necks and led them to the market place, in hopes of selling them and making a good profit. And indeed, buyers were not wanting. Candlewick was bought by a peasant whose donkey had died the previous day. Pinocchio was sold to the director of a company of buffoons and tightrope dancers. Who bought him that he might teach him to leap and to dance with the other animals belonging to the company? And now, my little readers, you will have understood the fine trade that little man pursued. The wicked little monster, who had a face all milk and honey, made frequent journeys round the world with his coach. As he went along, he collected with promises and flattery. All the idle boys who had taken a dislike to books and school, as soon as his coach was full, he conducted them to the land of boobies, that they might pass their time in games, in uproar, and in amusement. When these poor deluded boys, from continual play and no study, had become so many little donkeys, he took possession of them with great delight and satisfaction. And carry them off to the fairs and markets to be sold, and in this way, he had in a few years made heaps of money and had become a millionaire. What became of Candlewick, I do not know, but I do know that Pinocchio, from the very first day, had to endure a very hard, laborious life. When he was put into his stall, his master filled the manger with straw. But Pinocchio, having tried a mouthful, spat it out again. Then his master, grumbling, filled the manger with hay, but neither did the hay please him. Ah! Exclaimed his master in a passion, "Does not hay please you either? Leave it to me, my fine donkey. If you are so full of caprices, I will find a way to cure you." And by way of correcting him. He struck his legs with his whip. Pinocchio began to cry and to bray with pain, and he said, braying, "Hee haw! I cannot digest straw." Then eat hay," said his master, who understood perfectly the asinine dialect. "Hee haw! Hay gives me a pain in my stomach." Do you mean to pretend that a little donkey like you must be kept on breasts of chickens and capons in jelly? Asked his master, getting more and more angry and whipping him again. At the second whipping, Pinocchio prudently held his tongue and said nothing more. The stable was then shut, and Pinocchio was left alone. He had not eaten for many hours, and he began to yawn from hunger. And when he yawned, he opened a mouth that seemed as wide as an oven. At last, finding nothing else in the manger, he resigned himself and chewed a little hay. And after he had chewed it well, he shut his eyes and swallowed it.、Mm, this hay is not bad, he said to himself. But how much better it would have been if I had gone on with my studies. Ah! Instead of hay, I might now be eating a haunch of new bread and a fine slice of sausage. But I must have patience. The next morning, when he woke, he looked in the manger for a little more hay, 
but he found none, for he had eaten it all during the night. Then he took a mouthful of chopped straw, but whilst he was chewing it, he had to acknowledge that the taste of chopped straw did not in the least resemble a savory dish of macaroni or pie. But I must have patience, he repeated as he went on chewing. May my example serve at least as a warning to all disobedient boys who do not want to study. Patience! Patience indeed! shouted his master, coming at that moment into the stable. Do you think, my little donkey, that I bought you only to give you food and drink? <laughs> I bought you to make you work, and that you might earn money for me. Up then at once! You must come with me into the circus, and there I will teach you to jump through hoops, to go through frames of paper head foremost, to dance waltzes and polkas, and to stand upright on your hind legs. Poor Pinocchio, either by love or by force, had to learn all these fine things. But it took him three months before he had learned them, and he got many a whipping that nearly took off his skin. At last a day came when his master was able to announce that he would give a really extraordinary representation. The many colored placards stuck on the street corners were thus worded. Great full dress representation tonight will take place the usual feats and surprising performances executed by all the artists and by all the horses of the company, and moreover, the famous little donkey Pinocchio called the Star of the Dance will make his first appearance. The theater will be brilliantly illuminated. On that evening, as you may imagine, an hour before the play was to begin, the theater was crammed. There was not a place to be had either in the pit or the stalls, or in the boxes even, by paying its weight in gold. The benches round the circus were crowded with children and with boys of all ages, who were in a fever of impatience to see the famous little donkey Pinocchio dance. When the first part of the performance was over, the director of the company, dressed in a black coat, white breeches, and big leather boots that came above his knees, presented himself to the public, and after making a profound bow, he began with much solemnity the following ridiculous speech. Respectable public, ladies and gentlemen, the humble undersigned being a passer-by in this illustrious city, I have wished to procure for myself the honor, not to say the pleasure, of presenting to this intelligent and distinguished audience a celebrated little donkey, who has already had the honor of dancing in the presence of His Majesty the Emperor of all the principal courts of Europe. And thanking you, I beg of you to help us with your inspiring presence, and to be indulgent to us. This speech was received with much laughter and applause, but the applause redoubled and became tumultuous when the little donkey Pinocchio made his appearance in the middle of the circus. He was decked out for the occasion. He had a new bridle of polished leather with brass buckles and studs, and two white camellias in his ears. His mane was divided and curled, and each curl was tied with bows of colored ribbon. He had a girth of gold and silver round his body, and his tail was plated with amaranth and blue velvet ribbons. He was, in fact, a little donkey to fall in love with. The director, in presenting him to the public, added these few words. My respectable auditors, I am not here to tell you falsehoods of the great difficulties that I have overcome in understanding and subjugating this mammifer whilst he was grazing at liberty amongst the mountains and the plains of the torrid zone. I beg you will observe the wild rolling of his eyes. 
every means having been tried in vain to tame him and to accustom him to the life of domestic quadrupeds, I was often forced to have recourse to the convincing argument of the whip. But all my goodness to him, instead of gaining his affections, has, on the contrary, increased his viciousness. However, following the system of Gaul, I discovered in his cranium a bony cartilage that the faculty of medicine of Paris has itself recognized as the regenerating bulb of the hair and of dance. For this reason, I have not only taught him to dance, but also to jump through hoops and through frames covered with paper. Admire him, and then pass your opinion on him. But before taking my leave of you, permit me, ladies and gentlemen, to invite you to the daily performance that will take place tomorrow evening, uh, but in case the weather should threaten rain, the performance will be postponed till tomorrow morning at eleven ante meridian of post meridian. Here the director made another profound bow, and then turning to Pinocchio he said, Courage, Pinocchio, before you begin your feats, make your bow to this distinguished audience. Ladies, gentlemen, and children. Pinocchio obeyed and bent both his knees till they touched the ground, and remained kneeling until the director, cracking his whip, shouted to him, At the foot's pace! Then the little donkey raised himself on his four legs, and began to walk round the theatre, keeping at a foot's pace. After a little the director cried, Trot! and Pinocchio, obeying the order, changed to a trot. Gallop! And Pinocchio broke into a gallop. Full gallop! And Pinocchio went full gallop. But whilst he was going full speed like a racehorse, the director, raising his arm in the air, fired off a pistol. At the shot, the little donkey, pretending to be wounded, fell his whole length in the circus, as if he were really dying. As he got up from the ground amidst an outburst of applause, shouts, and clapping of hands, he naturally raised his head and looked up, and he saw in one of the boxes a beautiful lady who wore round her neck a thick gold chain from which hung a medallion. On the medallion was painted the portrait of a puppet. "'That is my portrait! That lady is the fairy!' said Pinocchio to himself. Recognizing her immediately, and overcome with delight, he tried to cry, "'Oh, my little fairy! Oh, my little fairy!' But instead of these words, a bray came from his throat, so sonorous and so prolonged, that all the spectators laughed, and more especially all the children who were in the theatre. Then the director, to give him a lesson, and to make him understand that it is not good manners to bray before the public, gave him a blow on his nose with the handle of his whip. The poor little donkey put his tongue out an inch and licked his nose for at least five minutes, thinking perhaps that it would ease the pain he felt. But what was his despair when, looking up a second time, he saw that the box was empty, and that the fairy had disappeared. He thought he was going to die. His eyes filled with tears, and he began to weep. Nobody, however, noticed it, and, least of all, the director who, cracking his whip, shouted, "'Courage, Pinocchio! Now let the audience see how gracefully you can jump through the hoops!' Pinocchio tried two or three times. But each time that he came in front of the hoop, instead of going through it, he found it easier to go under it. At last he made a leap and went through it, but his right leg unfortunately caught in the hoop, and that caused him to fall to the ground, doubled up in a heap on the other side. When he got up he was lame, and it was only with great difficulty that he managed to return to the stable. Bring out Pinocchio! We want the little donkey! Bring out the little donkey! shouted all the boys in the theater, touched and sorry for the sad accident. 
but the little donkey was seen no more that evening. The following morning the veterinary, that is, the doctor of animals, paid him a visit, and declared that he would remain lame for life. The director then said to the stable boy, What do you suppose I can do with a lame donkey? He would eat food without earning it. Take him to the market and sell him. When they reached the market, a purchaser was found at once. He asked the stable boy, How much do you want for that lame donkey? Twenty dollars. I will give you two dollars. Don't suppose that I am buying him to make use of. I am buying him solely for his skin. I see that his skin is very hard, and I intend to make a drum with it for the band of my village. Imagine poor Pinocchio's feelings when he heard that he was destined to become a drum. As soon as the purchaser had paid his two dollars, he conducted the little donkey to the seashore. He then put a stone round his neck and, tying a rope, the end of which he held in his hand, round his leg, he gave him a sudden push and threw him into the water. Pinocchio, weighted down by the stone, went at once to the bottom, and his owner, keeping tight hold of the cord, sat down quietly on a piece of rock to wait until the little donkey was drowned, intending then to skin him. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 of Pinocchio by Carlo Collotti This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34 Pinocchio is swallowed by the dogfish. After Pinocchio had been fifty minutes under the water, his purchaser said aloud to himself, My poor little lame donkey must by this time be quite drowned. I will therefore pull him out of the water, and I will make a fine drum of his skin. And he began to haul in the rope that he had tied to the donkey's leg, and he hauled, and hauled and hauled, until at last, what do you think appeared above the water? Instead of a little dead donkey, he saw a live puppet who was wriggling like an eel. Seeing this wooden puppet, the poor man thought he was dreaming, and, struck dumb with astonishment, he remained with his mouth open and his eyes staring out of his head. Having somewhat recovered from his first stupefaction, he asked in a quavering voice, uh, And the little donkey that I threw into the sea, what has become of him? I am the little donkey, said Pinocchio, laughing. You? I? Ah, oh, you young scamp! Do you dare to make game of me? To make game of you? Quite the contrary, my dear master. I am speaking seriously. But how can you, who but a short time ago were a little donkey, have become a wooden puppet only from having been left in the water? It must have been the effect of sea-water. The sea makes extraordinary changes. Beware, puppet, beware. Do you imagine that you can amuse yourself at my expense? Woe to you if I lose patience. Well, master, do you wish to know the true story? If you will set my leg free, I will tell you. The good man, who was curious to hear the true story, immediately untied the knot that kept him bound, and Pinocchio, finding himself free as a bird in the air, commenced as follows. You must know that I was once a puppet, as I am now, and I was on the point of becoming a boy, like many who are in the world, but instead, induced by my dislike for study and by the advice of bad companions, I ran away from home. One fine day when I awoke, I found myself changed into a donkey with long ears and a long tail. What a disgrace it was to me! A disgrace, dear master, that even your worst enemy would not inflict upon you. Taken to the market to be sold, I was bought by the director of an equestrian company, who took it into his head to make a famous dancer of me, and a famous leaper through hoops. But one night during a performance 
I had a bad fall in the circus and lamed both my legs. Then the director, not knowing what to do with a lame donkey, sent me to be sold, and you were the purchaser. Only too true, and I paid two dollars for you. And now who will give me back my good money? And why did you buy me? You bought me to make a drum of my skin. Only too true. And now where shall I find another skin? Don't despair, master. There are a number of little donkeys in the world. Tell me, you impertinent rascal, does your story end here? No, answered the puppet. I have another two words to say, and then I shall have finished. After you had bought me, you brought me to this place to kill me. But then, yielding to a feeling of compassion, you preferred to tie a stone round my neck and to throw me into the sea. This humane feeling does you great honor, and I shall always be grateful to you for it. But nevertheless, dear master, this time you made your calculations without considering the fairy. And who is the fairy? She is my mamma, and she resembles all other good mammas who care for their children, and who never lose sight of them, but help them lovingly, even when, on account of their foolishness and evil conduct, they deserve to be abandoned and left to themselves. Well, then, the good fairy, as soon as she saw that I was in danger of drowning, sent immediately an immense school of fish, who, believing me really to be a little dead donkey, began to eat me. And what mouthfuls they took! I should never have thought that fish were greedier than boys. Some ate my ears, some my muzzle, others my neck and mane, some the skin of my legs, some my coat. Amongst them there was a little fish so polite that he even condescended to eat my tail. From this time forth, said his purchaser, horrified, I swear that I will never touch fish. It would be too dreadful to open a mullet or a fried whiting and to find inside a donkey's tail. I agree with you, said the puppet, laughing. However, I must tell you that when the fish had finished eating the donkey's hide that covered me from head to foot, they naturally reached the bone, or rather the wood, for as you see I am made of the hardest wood. But after giving a few bites they soon discovered that I was not a morsel for their teeth, and, disgusted with such indigestible food, they went off, some in one direction and some in another, without so much as saying thank you to me. And now at last I have told you how it was that when you pulled up the rope you found a live puppet instead of a dead donkey. I laugh at your story, cried the man in a rage. I know only that I spent two dollars to buy you, and I will have my money back. Shall I tell you what I will do? I will take you back to the market, and I will sell you by weight as seasoned wood for lighting fires. Sell me if you like. I am content, said Pinocchio. But as he said it, he made a spring and plunged into the water. Swimming gaily away from the shore, he called to his poor owner, Good-bye, master. If you should be in want of a skin to make a drum, remember me. And he laughed and went on swimming, and after a while he turned and shouted louder, Good-bye, master. If you should be in want of a little well-seasoned wood for lighting the fire, remember me. In the twinkling of an eye he had swum so far off that he was scarcely visible. All that could be seen of him was a little black speck on the surface of the sea that from time to time lifted its legs out of the water and leaped and capered like a dolphin enjoying himself. Whilst Pinocchio was swimming, he knew not whither, he saw in the midst of the sea a rock that seemed to be made of white marble, and on the summit there stood a beautiful little goat, who bleated lovingly and made signs to him to approach. 
But the most singular thing was this. The little goat's hair, instead of being white or black, or a mixture of two colors as is usual with other goats, was blue, and a very vivid blue, greatly resembling the hair of the beautiful child. I leave you to imagine how rapidly poor Pinocchio's heart began to beat. He swam with redoubled strength and energy towards the white rock, and he was already halfway there when he saw, rising up out of the water and coming to meet him, the horrible head of a sea monster, his wide-open cavernous mouth and his three rows of enormous teeth would have been terrifying to look at even in a picture. And do you know what this sea monster was? This sea monster was neither more nor less than the gigantic dogfish, who has been mentioned many times in this story, and who, for his slaughter and his insatiable voracity, has been named the Attila of Fish and Fishermen. Only to think of poor Pinocchio's terror at the sight of the monster. He tried to avoid it, to change his direction. He tried to escape, but that immense wide-open mouth came towards him with the velocity of an arrow. "'Be quick, Pinocchio, for pity's sake!' cried the beautiful little goat, bleating. And Pinocchio swam desperately with his arms, his chest, his legs, and his feet. Quick, Pinocchio, the monster is close upon you. And Pinocchio swam quicker than ever, and flew on with the rapidity of a ball from a gun. He had nearly reached the rock, and the little goat, leaning over towards the sea, had stretched out her forelegs to help him out of the water. But it was too late. The monster had overtaken him, and drawing in his breath, he sucked in the poor puppet as you would have sucked a hen's egg, and he swallowed him with such violence and avidity that Pinocchio, in falling into the dogfish's stomach, received such a blow that he remained unconscious for a quarter of an hour afterwards. When he came to himself again after the shock, he could not in the least imagine in what world he was. All around him it was quite dark and the darkness was so black and so profound that it seemed to him that he had fallen head downwards into an inkstand full of ink. He listened, but he could hear no noise. Only from time to time great gusts of wind blew in his face. At first he could not understand where the wind came from, but at last he discovered that it came out of the monster's lungs for you must know that the dogfish suffered very much from asthma, and when he breathed it was exactly as if a north wind was blowing. Pinocchio at first tried to keep up his courage, but when he had one proof after another that he was really shot up in the body of this sea monster, he began to cry and scream and to sob out, <laughs> Help! Help! Oh, how unfortunate I am! Will nobody come to save me? "'Who do you think could save you, unhappy wretch?' said a voice in the dark that sounded like a guitar out of tune. "'Who is speaking?' asked Pinocchio, frozen with terror. "'It is I. I am a poor Tunny, who was swallowed by the dogfish at the same time that you were. And what fish are you?' "'I have nothing in common with fish. I am a puppet.' "'Then if you are not a fish—' Why did you let yourself be swallowed by the monster? I didn't let myself be swallowed. It was the monster swallowed me. And now what are we to do here in the dark? Resign ourselves and wait until the dogfish has digested us both. But I do not want to be digested, howled Pinocchio, beginning to cry again. Neither do I want to be digested, added the tunny. But I am enough of a philosopher to console myself by thinking that when one is born a tunny, it is more dignified to die in the water than in oil. That is all nonsense, cried Pinocchio. It is my opinion, replied the tunny, 
and opinions, so say the political tunnies, ought to be respected. To sum it all up, I want to get away from here. I want to escape. Escape, if you are able. Is this dogfish who has swallowed us very big? asked the puppet. Big? Why only imagine his body is two miles long without counting his tail? Whilst they were holding this conversation in the dark, Pinocchio thought that he saw a light a long way off. "'What is that little light I see in the distance?' he asked. "'It is most likely some companion in misfortune who is waiting like us to be digested. "'I will go and find him. "'Do you not think that it may by chance be some old fish who perhaps could show us how to escape?' "'I hope it may be so with all my heart, dear puppet. "'Good-bye, Tunny. "'Good-bye, puppet, and good fortune attend you. "'Where shall we meet again?' Who can say? It is better not even to think of it. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 of Pinocchio by Carlo Collati This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 35 A Happy Surprise for Pinocchio Pinocchio, having taken leave of his friend the Tunny, began to grope his way in the dark through the body of the dogfish, taking a step at a time in the direction of the light that he saw shining dimly at a great distance. The farther he advanced, the brighter became the light, and he walked and walked until at last he reached it, and when he reached it, what did he find? I will give you a thousand guesses. He found a little table spread out, and on it a lighted candle stuck into a green glass bottle, and, seated at the table, was a little old man. He was eating some live fish, and they were so very much alive that whilst he was eating them they sometimes even jumped out of his mouth. At this sight Pinocchio was filled with such great and unexpected joy that he became almost delirious. He wanted to laugh, he wanted to cry, he wanted to say a thousand things, and instead he could only stammer out a few confused and broken words. At last he succeeded in uttering a cry of joy, and opening his arms he threw them around the little old man's neck and began to shout, Oh, my dear papa, I have found you at last. I will never leave you more, never more, never more. Then my eyes tell me true, said the little old man, rubbing his eyes. Then you are really my dear Pinocchio? Yes, yes, I am Pinocchio, really Pinocchio. And you have quite forgiven me, have you not? Oh, my dear papa, how good you are. And to think that I, on the contrary, oh, but if you only knew what misfortunes have been poured on my head, and all that has befallen me. Only imagine the day that you, poor, dear Papa, sold your coat to buy me a spelling book that I might go to school. I escaped to see the puppet show, and the showman wanted to put me on the fire that I might roast his mutton. And he was the same that afterwards gave me five gold pieces to take them to you. But I met a fox and the cat, who took me to the inn of the red crawfish, where they ate like wolves. And I left by myself in the middle of the night, and I encountered assassins who ran after me. And I ran away, and they followed. And I ran, and they always followed me. And I ran until they hung me on to a branch of a big oak, and the beautiful child with blue hair sent a little carriage to fetch me, and the doctors, when they saw me, said immediately, If he is not dead, it is proof that he is still alive. And then, by chance, I told a lie, and my nose began to grow until I could no longer get through the door of the room, for which reason I went with the fox and the cat to bury the four gold pieces, for one I had spent at the inn, and the parrot began to laugh, and instead of two thousand gold pieces I found none left, for which reason the judge, when he heard that I had been robbed, had me immediately put in prison to content the robbers, 
and then when I was coming away I saw a beautiful bunch of grapes in a field, and I was caught in a trap, and the peasant, who was quite right, put a dog collar round my neck that I might guard the poultry yard, and acknowledging my innocence let me go, and the serpent with the smoking tail began to laugh and broke a blood vessel in his chest, and so I returned to the house of the beautiful child who was dead, and the pigeon, seeing that I was crying, said to me, I have seen your father who was building a little boat to go in search of you, and I said to him, Oh, if I only had wings! And he said to me, Do you want to go to your father? And I said, Without doubt, but who will take me to him? And he said, I will take you. And I said to him, How? And he said to me, Get on my back. And so we flew all night, and then in the morning all the fishermen who were looking out to sea said to me, there is a poor man in a boat who is on the point of being drowned. And I recognized you at once, even at that distance, for my heart told me, and I made signs to you to return to land. I also recognized you, said Geppetto, and I would willingly have returned to the shore, but what was I to do? The sea was tremendous, and a great wave upset my boat. Then a horrible dogfish who was near— as soon as he saw me in the water, came towards me, and, putting out his tongue, took hold of me and swallowed me as if I had been a little apple tart. "'How long have you been shut up here?' asked Pinocchio. "'Since that day. It must be nearly two years ago. Two years, my dear Pinocchio, that have seemed like two centuries.' "'And how have you managed to live?' And where did you get the candle and the matches to light it? Who gave them to you? Stop. I will tell you everything. Uh, you must know, then, that in the same storm in which my boat was upset, a merchant vessel foundered. The sailors were all saved, but the vessel went to the bottom, and the dogfish, who had that day an excellent appetite, after he had swallowed me, swallowed also the vessel. How? He swallowed it in one mouthful, and the only thing that he spat out was the mainmast that had stuck between his teeth like a fishbone. Ah, fortunately for me, the vessel was laden with preserved meat in tins, biscuits, bottles of wine, dried raisins, cheese, coffee, sugar, candles, and boxes of wax matches. With this providential supply, I have been able to live for two years." But I have arrived at the end of my resources. There is nothing left in the larder, and this candle that you see burning is the last that remains. And after that? After that, dear boy, we shall both remain in the dark. Then, dear little papa, said Pinocchio, there is no time to lose. We must think of escaping. Of escaping? How? We must escape through the mouth of the dogfish, throw ourselves into the sea, and swim away. You talk well, but, dear Pinocchio, I don't know how to swim. What does that matter? I am a good swimmer, and you can get on my shoulders, and I will carry you safely to shore. All illusions, my boy, replied Geppetto, shaking his head with a melancholy smile. Do you suppose it possible that a puppet like you, scarcely a yard high, could have the strength to swim with me on his shoulders? Try it, and you will see. Without another word, Pinocchio took the candle in his hand, and going in front to light the way, he said to his father, Follow me, and don't be afraid. And they walked for some time, and traversed the body and the stomach of the dogfish. But when they had arrived at the point where the monster's big throat began, they thought it better to stop to give it a good look around, and to choose the best moment for escaping. Now I must tell you that the dogfish, being very old and suffering from asthma and palpitation of the heart, was obliged to sleep with his mouth open. Pinocchio, therefore, having approached the entrance to his throat and looking up, could see beyond the enormous gaping mouth a large piece of starry sky and beautiful moonlight. "'This is the moment to escape,' he whispered, turning to his father. 
The dogfish is sleeping like a dormouse. The sea is calm, and it is as light as day. Follow me, dear papa, and in a short time we shall be in safety. They immediately climbed up the throat of the sea monster, and having reached his immense mouth, they began to walk on tiptoe down his tongue. Before taking the final leap, the puppet said to his father, Get on my shoulders and put your arms tightly around my neck. I will take care of the rest. As soon as Geppetto was firmly settled on his son's shoulders, Pinocchio, feeling sure of himself, threw himself into the water and began to swim. The sea was as smooth as oil, the moon shone brilliantly, and the dogfish was sleeping so profoundly that even a cannonade would have failed to wake him. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 36 Pinocchio at last ceases to be a puppet and becomes a boy. Whilst Pinocchio was swimming quickly towards the shore, he discovered that his father, who was on his shoulders with his legs in the water, was trembling as violently as if the poor man had an attack of ague fever. Was he trembling from cold or from fear? Perhaps a little from both the one and the other, but Pinocchio, thinking it was from fear, said to comfort him, "'Courage, Papa! In a few minutes we shall be safely on shore.' "'But where is this blessed shore?' asked the little old man, becoming still more frightened, and screwing up his eyes as tailors do when they wish to thread a needle. "'I have been looking in every direction, and I see nothing but the sky and the sea.' "'But I see the shore as well,' said the puppet. "'You must know that I am like a cat. I see better by night than by day.' Poor Pinocchio was making a pretense of being in good spirits, but in reality he was beginning to feel discouraged. His strength was failing, he was gasping and panting for breath. He could do no more, and the shore was still far off. He swam until he had no breath left. Then he turned his head to Geppetto and said in broken words, "'Papa, help me!' I am dying. The father and son were on the point of drowning when they heard a voice, like a guitar out of tune, saying, Who is it that is dying? It is I and my poor father. I know that voice. You are Pinocchio. Precisely. And you? I am the Tawny, your prison companion in the body of the dogfish. And how did you manage to escape? I followed your example. You showed me the road, and I escaped after you. Tony, you have arrived at the right moment. I implore you to help us, or we are lost. Willingly and with all my heart. You must, both of you, take hold of my tail and leave it to me to guide you. I will take you on shore in four minutes. Geppetto and Pinocchio, as I need not tell you, accepted the offer at once. But instead of holding on by his tail, they thought it would be more comfortable to get on the tunny's back. Having reached the shore, Pinocchio sprang first on land that he might help his father to do the same. He then turned to the tunny and said to him in a voice full of emotion, My friend, you have saved my papa's life. I can find no words with which to thank you properly. Permit me at least to give you a kiss as a sign of my eternal gratitude. The tunny put his head out of the water, and Pinocchio, kneeling on the ground, kissed him tenderly on the mouth. At this spontaneous proof of warm affection, the poor Tunny, who was not accustomed to it, felt extremely touched, and ashamed to let himself be seen crying like a child, he plunged under the water and disappeared. By this time the day had dawned, 
Pinocchio, then offering his arm to Geppetto, who had scarcely breath to stand, said to him, Lean on my arm, dear papa, and let us go. We will walk very slowly like ants, and when we are tired we can rest by the wayside. And where shall we go? asked Geppetto. In search of some house or cottage, where they will give us for charity a mouthful of bread and a little straw to serve as a bed. They had not gone a hundred yards when they saw by the roadside two villainous-looking individuals begging. They were the cat and the fox, but they were scarcely recognizable. Fancy! The cat had so long feigned blindness that she had become blind in reality, and the fox, old, mangy, and with one side paralyzed, had not even his tail left. That sneaking thief, having fallen into the most squalid misery, one fine day had found himself obliged to sell his beautiful tail to a traveling peddler, who bought it to drive away flies. "'Oh, Pinocchio!' cried the fox. "'Give a little in charity to two poor infirm people.' "'Infirm people!' repeated the cat. "'Be gone, impostors!' answered the puppet. "'You took me in once, but you will never catch me again.' "'Believe me, Pinocchio, we are now poor and unfortunate indeed. "'If you are poor, you deserve it.' Recollect the proverb, stolen money never fructifies. Be gone, impostors. And thus saying, Pinocchio and Geppetto went their way in peace. When they had gone another hundred yards, they saw at the end of a path in the middle of the fields a nice little straw hut with a roof of tiles and bricks. That hut must be inhabited by someone said Pinocchio. Let us go and knock at the door. They went and knocked. Who's there? said a little voice. We are a poor father and son without bread and without a roof, answered the puppet. Turn the key and the door will open, said the same little voice. Pinocchio turned the key and the door opened. They went in and looked here, there, and everywhere, but could see no one. "'Oh, where is the master of the house?' said Pinocchio, much surprised. "'Here I am, up here.' The father and son looked immediately up to the ceiling, and there, on a beam, they saw the talking cricket. "'Oh, my dear little cricket,' said Pinocchio, bowing politely to him. "'Ah, now you call me your dear little cricket.' But do you remember the time when you threw the handle of a hammer at me to drive me from your house? You are right, Cricket. Drive me away also. Throw the handle of a hammer at me, but have pity on my poor papa. I will have pity on both father and son, but I wished to remind you of the ill treatment I received from you to teach you that in this world, when it is possible, we should show courtesy to everybody, if we wish it to be extended to us in our hour of need. You are right, Cricket, you are right, and I will bear in mind the lesson you have given me. But tell me how you managed to buy this beautiful hut. This hut was given to me yesterday by a goat whose wool was of a beautiful blue color. And where has the goat gone? asked Pinocchio with lively curiosity. I do not know. And when will it come back? It will never come back. It went away yesterday in great grief, and bleating it seemed to say, Poor Pinocchio, I shall never see him more. "'for by this time the dogfish must have devoured him.' "'Did it really say that? "'Then it was she, it was my dear little fairy!' "'exclaimed Pinocchio, crying and sobbing. "'When he had cried for some time, "'he dried his eyes and prepared a comfortable bed of straw "'for Geppetto to lie down on. 
Then he asked the cricket, Tell me, little cricket, where can I find a tumbler of milk for my poor papa? Three fields off from here there lives a gardener called Giangio who keeps cows. Go to him, and you will get the milk you are in want of. Pinocchio ran all the way to Giangio's house, and the gardener asked him, How much milk do you want? I want a tumbler full. A tumbler of milk costs five cents. Begin by giving me the five cents. I have not even one cent, replied Pinocchio, grieved and mortified. That is bad, puppet, answered the gardener. If you have not even one cent, I have not even a drop of milk. I must have patience, said Pinocchio, and he turned to go. Wait a little, said Giangio. We can come to an arrangement together. Will you undertake to turn the pumping machine? What is the pumping machine? It is a wooden pole which serves to draw up the water from the cistern to water the vegetables. You can try me. Well, then, if you will draw a hundred buckets of water, I will give you, in compensation, a tumbler of milk. It is a bargain. Giangio then led Pinocchio to the kitchen garden and taught him how to turn the pumping machine. Pinocchio immediately began to work, but before he had drawn up the hundred buckets of water, the perspiration was pouring from his head to his feet. Never before had he undergone such fatigue. Up till now, said the gardener, the labor of turning the pumping machine was performed by my little donkey, but the poor animal is dying. Will you take me to see him? said Pinocchio. Willingly. When Pinocchio went into the stable, he saw a beautiful little donkey stretched on the straw, worn out from hunger and overwork. After looking at him earnestly, he said to himself, much troubled, I am sure I know this little donkey. His face is not new to me. And bending over him, he asked him in asinine language, Who are you? At this question, the little donkey opened his dying eyes and answered in broken words in the same language, I am Candlewick. And having again closed his eyes, he expired. Oh, poor Candlewick, said Pinocchio in a low voice, and taking a handful of straw, he dried a tear that was rolling down his face. Do you grieve for a donkey that cost you nothing? said the gardener. What must it be to me who bought him for ready money? I must tell you he was my friend. Your friend? One of my schoolfellows. How? shouted Giangio, laughing loudly. How? Had you donkeys for schoolfellows? I can imagine what wonderful studies you must have made. The puppet, who felt much mortified at these words, did not answer. But taking his tumbler of milk, still quite warm, he returned to the hut. And from that day, for more than five months, he continued to get up at daybreak every morning to go and turn the pumping machine to earn the tumbler of milk that was of such benefit to his father in his bad state of health. Nor was he satisfied with this, for during the time that he had over, he learned to make hampers and baskets of rushes, and with the money he obtained by selling them, he was able with great economy to provide for all the daily expenses. Amongst other things, he constructed an elegant little wheelchair in which he could take his father out on fine days to breathe a mouthful of fresh air. By his industry, ingenuity, and his anxiety to work and to overcome difficulties, he not only succeeded in maintaining his father, who continued infirm, in comfort, but he also contrived to put aside five dollars to buy himself a new coat. One morning he said to his father, I am going to the neighboring market 
to buy myself a jacket, a cap, and a pair of shoes. When I return, he added laughing, I shall be so well dressed that you will take me for a fine gentleman. And leaving the house, he began to run merrily and happily along. All at once, he heard himself call by name, and turning around, he saw a big snail crawling out from the hedge. Do you not know me? asked the snail. It seems to me, and yet I am not sure, do you not remember the snail who was lady's maid to the fairy with blue hair? Do you not remember the time when I came downstairs to let you in, and you were caught by your foot, which you had stuck through the house door? I remember it all, shouted Pinocchio. Tell me quickly, my beautiful little snail, where have you left my good fairy? What is she doing? Has she forgiven me? Does she still remember me? Does she still wish me well? Is she far from here? Can I go and see her? To all these rapid, breathless questions, the snail replied in her usual phlegmatic manner, My dear Pinocchio, the poor fairy is lying in bed at the hospital. At the hospital? Ah, oh, it is only too true. Overtaken by a thousand misfortunes, she has fallen seriously ill, and she has not even enough to buy herself a mouthful of bread. Is it really so? Oh, what sorrows you have given me! Oh, poor fairy, poor fairy, poor fairy! If I had a million, I would run and carry it to her, uh, but I have only five dollars. Here they are. I was going to buy a new coat. Take them, snail, and carry them at once to my good fairy. And your new coat? What matters my new coat? I would sell even these rags that I have on to be able to help her. Go, snail, and be quick, and in two days return to this place for I hope I shall then be able to give you some more money. Up to this time I have worked to maintain my papa. From today I will work five hours more, that I may also maintain my good mamma. Goodbye, snail. I shall expect you in two days. The snail, contrary to her usual habits, began to run like a lizard in a hot August sun. That evening Pinocchio, instead of going to bed at ten o'clock, sat up till midnight had struck, and instead of making eight baskets of rushes, he made sixteen. Then he went to bed and fell asleep, and while he slept he thought that he saw the fairy, smiling and beautiful, who, after having kissed him, said to him, "'Well done, Pinocchio, to reward you for your good heart.' I will forgive you for all that is past. Boys who minister tenderly to their parents and assist them in their misery and infirmities are deserving of great praise and affection, even if they cannot be cited as examples of obedience and good behavior. Try and do better in the future, and you will be happy. At this moment his dream ended, and Pinocchio opened his eyes and awoke. But imagine his astonishment, when upon awakening he discovered that he was no longer a wooden puppet, but that he had become, instead, a boy like all other boys. He gave a glance round, and saw that the straw halls of the hut had disappeared, and that he was in a pretty little room, furnished and arranged with a simplicity that was almost elegance. Jumping out of bed, he found a new suit of clothes ready for him, a new cap and a new pair of boots that fitted him beautifully. He was hardly dressed when he naturally put his hands in his pockets and pulled out a little ivory purse on which these words were written. The fairy with blue hair returns the five dollars to her dear Pinocchio and thanks him for his good heart. He opened the purse, and instead of five dollars, he saw fifty shining gold pieces, fresh from the mint. He then went and looked at himself in the glass, and he thought he was someone else. 
for he no longer saw the usual reflection of a wooden puppet. He was greeted instead by the image of a bright, intelligent boy with chestnut hair, blue eyes, and looking as happy and joyful as if it were the Easter holidays. In the midst of all these wonders succeeding each other, Pinocchio felt quite bewildered, and he could not tell if he was really awake or if he was dreaming with his eyes opened. "'Where can my papa be?' he exclaimed suddenly, and went into the next room. He found old Geppetto quite well, lively, and in good humor, just as he had been formerly. He had already resumed his trade of wood-carving, and he was designing a rich and beautiful frame of leaves, flowers, and the heads of animals. "'Satisfy my curiosity, dear papa,' said Pinocchio, throwing his arms around his neck and covering him with kisses. "'How can this sudden change be accounted for?' "'This sudden change in our home is all you're doing,' answered Geppetto. "'How am I doing?' "'Because when boys who have behaved badly turn over a new leaf and become good, they have the power of bringing contentment and happiness to their families.' "'And where has the old wooden Pinocchio hidden himself?' "'There he is,' answered Geppetto and he pointed to a big puppet leaning against a chair, with its head on one side, its arms dangling, and its legs so crossed and bent that it was really a miracle that it remained standing. Pinocchio turned and looked at it, and after he had looked at it for a short time, he said to himself with great complacency, How ridiculous I was when I was a puppet! And how glad I am that I have become a well-behaved little boy. End of chapter 36 End of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi Translated by Carol Della Chiesa This book recorded by Phil Chenever in September 2013, Baton Rouge, Louisiana.